Good Sunday evening, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Top 50 Classic Adventures of All Time. It's a mouthful, um, but we love it. So this is episode three. Uh, I am your co-host, Chris, with the co-host, Rick. Rick, say hi to everybody. Hello, folks. Happy and to join us. Yeah, and happy happy Easter to yes. uh, folks who are celebrating out there. We know we're coming on a holiday, but we didn't want to stop the show just because of a holiday. Um, <laughs> and we have a special guest tonight, our first special guest, and I want to introduce him right off of the bat, uh, so we can find out a little bit about, um, what makes him tick and everything. Uh, everybody, this is Scott Moore. Uh, Scott, why don't you give us a little introduction about yourself and how long you've been gaming and, uh, if you do anything for Goodman Games that you're allowed to talk about and, um, okay. all that good stuff. Sure. Thanks, Chris. Um, let's see. I've been gaming since late. I don't know. I'll say mid eighties, probably about 1984. Um, mm -hmm. High school was my gateway into tabletop role playing. Um, started with uh, the basic and expert sets, which were then quickly replaced by the basic expert companion masters and immortal sets. Okay. Um, uh, I'm a big fan of D and D is probably my first top role-playing game but uh all the box sets from the 80s and 90s from tsr i have a special love for um i've been writing for probably probably just over two decades or so uh for various companies in the rpg industry over the past three years i've been doing a lot of stuff for goodman games uh the most recently announced stuff the original adventures reincarnated seven dark tower which just came out uh, and then the next volume announced is eight, which is Grimtooth Traps, and nine, which is Caverns of Thracia. So I uh, did some contributions to oh. each of those and a few other projects uh, coming out after that further down the road. Oh, you're catching up to me on those ore books. I got to get my get my act back together here. <laughs> so you're you're getting your rarefied air uh, working on three of them. Um, that's that puts you, I think, in the number two spot. So well, welcome Ooh. to the show, Scott. Um, we're, we're glad to have you here. A little bit of foreshadowing. There's probably a really good reason why Scott's here tonight. Um, probably what we're going to, you know, he might have particular expertise on some of, of the, the titles that we're going to have. So that we're going to talk about. Um, but, uh, uh, so real quick, I really don't have too many announcements, uh, for folks except for, um, it's, uh, it's been all monsters all the time here on the Goodman Games front, um, as we are working around the clock literally and on the weekends to get that uh 600 plus page book two of them uh off to the printer uh which is going to happen in days days we're not even measuring it in weeks anymore in days um so that's cool uh just got back from oh, a week ago already but uh gary Khan was last year and I, i'm right out the gat i was talking to rick about this um for those of you folks who have never gone to gary Khan before you have to do it you have to spend an extra day or two there in Lake Geneva and walk the walk the, the, the streets of the town and everything where it all happened and everything. Uh, but Gary, Gary Khan is amazing. Um, you just you you run into the uh, the coolest folks that have worked on role playing games literally for decades. Um, it's a smallish it's a smallish convention. It's kind of getting big, bigger and bigger and everything. But it's just it's got a charm to it. Um, it's a bummer that it's in March and it usually snows and it's really cold. Um, but anyway, it's great. It's right in Lake Geneva. And I have to admit, um, I lost track of the number of times fans tracked me <laughs> down and stopped me at the booth, in the hall, in the food line, in the bathroom <laughs> um, to say that they were huge fans of Talking TSR and they're very bummed that we stopped the show. And they were also looking for you, Rick. They just assumed that you were going to be with me because we do everything together. Apparently. We do everything together, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. So I was next like, year. Yeah, it was cool. <laughs> um, and and folks have already said they've been starting to watch the new show and everything, so they're excited about that. So anyway, th so thank you everybody for for saying a couple kind words while I was there. It's great. Like I said, nice. we kind of talk in a vacuum here, and we we don't get that. We don't get that two-way talk back and forth with yeah. the fans outside of the chat. So it's actually really cool to get some feedback that folks like what we're doing and that folks were bummed of the old show that we did that we stopped. Um, so uh, so thank you for that. And and like I said, uh, Gary Khan, um, people put it on your list. It's, it's a bucket list kind of thing. You got to do it once. Got to do it once. Um, and, and when you do it, go all in and everything. So. 
So we've got a great show uh, for everybody tonight. Um, so we are going to be counting down number 45 through 41. So we'll be done with the 40s. Well, almost done with the 40s tonight um, uh, on our amazing countdown. Um, any comments before we get into it, Rick and or Scott? I think we can dive right into it. Dive right into it? Yeah, that's good. It. Okay. All right. Well, then we will... We will reveal uh, number 45. Number 45. All right. So, uh, A1, Slave Pits of the Undercity. Um, definitely, it's this This one's ironic for me. Um, this used to be my favorite. Well, I, I don't know. I waffled back and forth. This, this was one of my favorite of the Slaver series back in the day. Um, but then I've kind of learned to love A2, I think, more. <laughs> um, which is kind of funny. I think there's a little bit more adventure there in A2. Um, but this one still is, it's got all sorts of nostalgia. I mean, it's got the player character sheets, the pre-gens. It's got the tournament scoring. Um, it's got the kind of funky where you get the maps where it's like, this is the tournament parts and this is the campaign mm -hmm. parts, which was always kind of confusing. Um, it's got that great cover art, the aspices. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, it, it's just so many good things. Um, Rick, what do you love about A1, um, Slate Pits of the Undercity? I always actually like that sort of modularity about it, if you pardon the pun, because as a DM, even if I wasn't doing a tournament, I could always kind of look at that tournament material and almost use it as extra or not, or it let me sort of tailor the module a little bit to my feel. And I always felt like the tournament rooms, they didn't feel as strongly like tournament rooms. You know, too many of these, I think, older adventures the tournament rooms feel too simple, too puzzle-like, too, there is a rope hanging down in the center of the room. What do you do? And there's, and, and, you know, where yep. here it was incorporated a little more into the overall theme, which I really liked. Um, I think this is still my probably favorite of the Slaver series. Wow. It's hard. There's, really? it's a really, I think I saw, I think I raised your stock on A2 and it's funny. Like yeah, I, definitely. and you raised my stock on A4. So I think, uh, it's a tie between this and A4 for my absolute favorite of the series, but I love the whole series and I liked when they remade it as well. I just feel like yeah. I've run it many times and it's always lots of fun, lots of varied encounters. Um, so very worthy of its position here on our list to be sure. Yeah. Yeah. And again, keep in mind folks that folks might be thinking this is kind of low for a classic, but it, it's not because, you know, the others, the other A's are probably going to make it on this list too, and maybe even the compilation adventure. So, so, you know, the fact that it, it made it through into the top 50 is probably, uh, it, it's probably the kudos it deserves right off the bat. Um, I always remember the design philosophy of, of the tournament modules, how it was like each, each adventure was, it was split up into two parts. There was like a, a round one and a round two, um, and then it each featured a specific type of humanoid, had a one new monster, had a puzzle, had a trap, and then had a like a boss encounter kind of thing. Um, I actually kind of like that. I thought that mm -hmm. from a from a tournament uh, design standpoint, I think we used a lot of those lessons when we were uh, starting to do the Goodman Games uh, team tournaments back in the uh, whenever that was uh, the 2000s and then took a pause for a while and then back again. So. So I think a lot can be learned from the tournament parts of this adventure. Um, and, you know, it, it took a little bit of extra work, I think, but I think it worked for a campaign as well. Um, Scott, what you said that you you this was not a huge one on your list. Did you ever play it? Game Master it? Remember I did, it? Like, I did not play it. And okay. the reason was uh, around, around this time in history, there was the two distinct schools of basic expert D&D &D and yep. AD&D. Uh, and I was more in the basic expert D and D camp, so I did not play this adventure. Okay. Um, the thing that stands out to me was just the Jeff D art because I love Jeff yes. D art. But there's so many classic artists from the early tabletop RPG days that you just kind of love to grab an old module and flip back through it and say, "Oh yeah, those were great pictures." But yeah, oh, I I totally agree. The uh, some of that old that artwork was great. I think there was even like. A I think there might have been a couple of full page ones in in the A series. I know, yeah. um, which back in the day we didn't get a lot. We got a lot of those little tiny little ones to fill in the little gaps and everything. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I just I I love the image. I, I wish I, I think probably one thing that I think holds this one back definitely compared to the other ones 
is that the final boss battle with the the slaver at the end is I think pretty weak. It's like yeah. you know, it's basically yeah. a dude with some. Is that the is that the one with the giant weasels? Yeah, he's got the giant weasels, yeah. and he's in. He's in a little bit of an interesting chamber, but like you know, when you get to A two, oh, it's like just you get, you get some really good solid NPCs. Yeah. And then obviously when you, you do A4 and you get out and you escape the dungeons and then you get the fate, all of the mm -hmm. the the, uh, the slave lords, it's just, it takes it to another level and everything. So I think that's that's probably the one thing I think that holds this one back that they just didn't, just that 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 final encounter kind of, kind of fell flat for me a little bit, I think. So uh, I don't know what you think about that, Rick. I mean, is that... Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly yeah. agree. I, I found th there were one or two fights before the final encounter that I think were better than the final encounter. Yeah, yeah, I would um, kind of agree with that. You know, there was like a courtyard or wherever. There was a very interesting encounter there. Um, and again, I echo on the art. I love the Jeff D art. Yeah. And even some of the illustrations really worked as player handouts. Like I remember there was mm -hmm. the room where you had the sort of wooden plank that went across yep. the collapsed yeah. floor. I can't tell you how many times I blew up that illustration or just flashed my book at the players and said, this mm -hmm. is what you see, because it was perfect. It, it nice. was a perfect illustration to show the players. So throughout the whole series, I really felt the art helped embody the feel of the Slaver series, especially when it came to the humanoids personalities, you know, mm -hmm. the various drawings of orcs and aspis and these different and later on boggles and things and these humanoids you'd run into. Uh, it really helped give some flavor to the series. Yeah, I I, I agree a hundred percent. Um, I I really, I, yeah, I, I'll totally agree with that. There was there was definitely a couple of encounters that I think definitely trumped that that final encounter. Yeah, there was that one that that courtyard ambush. There was like the crude yeah. flamethrower in there. Yeah, and yeah, there was some there was some really cool innovative things where um it was fascinating. And I know I've used the map of of this adventure basically as a ruined temple for other adventures and stuff mm -hmm. like that because i thought it was so classic and it was exactly like i need a ruined temple i'm like yeah. oh here we go this will be perfect so um so yeah definitely so that is um number 45 a1 slave pits of the undercity uh that was an ad and &D adventure 1980 um and that was written by david cook um and like i said 1980 so um, that was, I believe it was used as a tournament in the 70s, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then that was, it was published in mm -hmm. 1980. Um, and I actually think all four of the A's, I think, came out. Um, they might have been 80 to 81, but they were actually pretty tight. You know, it was it wasn't these yeah. things where, you know, you had to wait a very long time for the whole series to get out. So they they kind of release them um in in good timing so uh so that's number 45 so we will now transition move over to number 44 number 44 all right so this is this was a surprise <laughs> i i will admit um this was not on my list this one kind of came out of nowhere but but you know it makes sense we, you know when rick and i had our pre-show we talked about what makes a good classic adventure. And one of the things we said is an adventure that occurs in several editions is is probably a good classic adventure because you mm -hmm. keep that, you know, the writers and, and the publisher keeps going back to it and everything. And and this certainly certainly fits that bill. I mean, it was it was in the original. I have it, I know, I know Scott's gonna trump me a bit here, but it was in the original <laughs> Blackmore book. <laughs> so that was its first appearance in 1975. It, it yeah. did later show up in the, is it, was it basic or expert? It was basic. It was an expert right? module. It was an expert was, module. Uh, yeah, yes, it was it was expert DA2. The Dave um, Arneson series of TSI yep, modules. The, yep, exactly. And then it showed up again in third edition. Uh, was it, that yeah. was, that was Zeitgeist Games, right? Yeah, he's got that too. Yep. yep that Temple of the Frog. Um, oh, it does not. It does not. Like blurred back on. on. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm well, well we have to thank Rick. Thank Scott go. for being here tonight. No, it's like, um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. So again, um, it, it, this was one of the ones where when when I saw this made the list and I saw this show coming up, I had to go dig into my collection and pull out and reread that one. Um, and and I did. I actually spent a really good time rereading it. Mm -hmm. And um, I would like to be convinced on why this is a good module. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, it's 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 fine. I think I know. I think I know the answer to that, but. But Scott, you have the floor. Why, why do you love this? You you put this on your list, and it was on your list. I think fairly. I high. did. 
So um, tell us it, why. It probably was. And I'm, you know, in full disclosure, I am a huge Blackmore fan. Um, Dave, Dave Arneson and I were pen pals back in the uh, early 2000s wow. before, right before when he was in the process of kind of starting uh, Zeke Geist games. Mm-hmm. Um, and he told me at the time, and I think it was, I want to say it was 2004 when Goodman Games yep. um, actually published the, the third edition Blackmore source book. Um, and it was just before that came out, uh, Dave said that uh, Return to the Temple of Frog was going to be one of the first releases. As it turns out, the third edition of Temple of Frog didn't come out until like 2007 or 2008, <laughs> I think it was. Um, but if you think of the if you think of the standard fantasy adventure for Dungeons and Dragons, whether it's mm-hmm. a, a dungeon crawl or something like that, there's you know essentially a maze full of monsters you go through and you slaughter. Uh, and this could be seen initially kind of from that same viewpoint. Oh, it's an evil temple. There's probably monsters and priests in there, you know, doing all sorts of nasty things. We have to, uh, you know, kill all the monsters, take all their gold, etc. But it's really like walking in halfway through Dave Arneson's Blackmore campaign. And mm-hmm. there was so much other stuff going on mm-hmm. that it really could be a gateway to an entire larger campaign. I mean, you could treat it treat it as just a simple, hey, we have to head to this evil temple and wipe out the bad guys. Um, but you know, I I assume none of this is spoilers since it came out in 1975. So I would assume again, you're not gonna we're not gonna there's spoil a 49 year safe. limit that you can't yeah. yell, hey, spoilers. Yeah. So um, but the the high priest, Stephen the Rock, was actually an alien who came to Blackmore. Uh, as part of a crew to explore the planet and the ship crashed. So several years before expedition to the barrier peaks, um, we had the temple of the frog Mm -hmm. and Steven was actually somebody who um, uh, left the crew of the crashed spaceship and managed to take over this uh, temple in the swamp dedicated to a frog God. And as the characters explore the temple, you start finding weird items that don't fit a fantasy setting people have you know blaster pistols and stuff like that uh and i know expedition to the barrier peaks is typically considered you know this is the first science fiction in a fantasy module because it was a crashed spaceship well there's a there's something called a command console in the uh temple of the frog which is essentially a teleporting spaceship um that steven has access to uh to pilot so it um, but if you if you just wanted a an evil temple with a dungeon underneath that had nasty things like medusas and giant frogs, yep. frogs and stuff like that, that was all in there. Um, but if you were going to play a Blackmore campaign or build a campaign around it, there were so many things from the history of Blackmore tied yeah. into this one adventure. Um, for those of you who are fr- fans of Greyhawk and know Mordekainen, one of Mordekainen's famous adventures was the City of the Gods. The City mm-hmm. of the Gods in Blackmore was actually the sp- the crashed spaceship that yeah. uh, Stephen the Rock had come from yep. um, when he moved into the Temple of the Frog. So there was a lot of uh, Dave Arneson's early campaign history um, all kind of wrapped up in this. And remember, 1975, people weren't really talking about campaigns. D&D was mostly just no. kind of like one shots, except for you know these yeah. two groups of guys in, in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin at that point. So yeah. I, I loved the history of the campaign that was brought into it. Yeah, and not only that, there weren't adventures back then either. Like you said, you you I think you even said it um in your notes uh back to me where like it's quite possibly the first published adventure. You yeah. can tell it kind of rambles a little bit and it doesn't have a you know, it doesn't have a great format. Um, but it does hadn't quite figured it, out how to write modules yet. Exactly. Yeah, there right. was there was no template back then. No, there was, was like nobody knew how rough, to write an adventure. But... It was literally a collection of notes, but yeah. but you're right, it was like steeped in all of this. You could tell it was steeped in backstory and history. And the whole mm-hmm. Stephen the Rock part was 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 just a fascinating part where they don't even like you said, they, they kind of hint at it. They kind of hint in the adventure. If you like for me, I think they, they kind of give you that whole ancient aliens vibe. Yeah. And and kind of say, here's a bunch of stuff, but, you know, we're not going to tell you everything that is like, you know, we're not going to detail everything out. But it's just just enough to kind of get you thinking that's like, wow, there's a lot more here mm-hmm. than than literally meets the eye. Um, And then, you know, then there's this breeding pond at the bottom with a thousand frogs, killer frogs, <laughs> killer frogs, which is funny, which I did. I didn't make that connection 
that I remember Killer Frogs being in the Monster Manual, I think, AD&D Monster Manual. Mm -hmm. And I did not make that connection that the Killer Frogs were here. And I'm like, oh, that's where the killer... I was like, it was kind of <laughs> weird that like mm -hmm. Killer Frogs in the Monster Manual. I was like, what is a Killer Frog besides a badass frog? But um, but yeah, so that was really kind of cool. So You're right, so your though, Chris. Like... That with classic adventures that get revisited, um, this was, like you mentioned, it was in the original Supplement 2 to the original D&D. Yep. &D. Mm -hmm. It was the DA2 module for Expert D&D. &D. Yep. It was the third edition module from yep. um, uh, Zeke Ice Games, mm -hmm. which was also a playable module in the Blackmore Living Campaign, the okay. MMRPG Living Campaign. And they had a prequel adventure to the Temple of the Frog that you could also play as part of the Living Campaign. And then around the same time, Wizards of the Coast came out with a sequel, a free downloadable sequel adventure called Return to the Temple of the Frog that took place like 20 years in the future. Mm -hmm. um, you got to see what happened to Stephen the Rock over that uh, period of 20 years. Uh, so there's a lot of, you know, just the temple itself almost has an entire campaign around it. Mm -hmm. Totally. The, the Blackmore setting, I always felt, gave the DM a lot of places to run because you had all the different power groups and countries and, you know, kind of um, even semi-mysterious semi entities or rulers things like the egg of coot and these things that uh i felt like a dm could really run with and you could see the hintings of that in this which was nice and and certainly you saw it get expanded later when it got the real module treatment you know they really kind of buffed that up which was nice yeah uh great comment by dw uh, gable crazy continuity yes i mean because like <laughs> you said you you were basically when you were you know, got into Temple of the Frog, you're kind of almost invited to Dave's table, essentially, yeah. and his campaign. Um, and, and you saw a lot of that. Like, if you look at the old guy, the, the you know, the early Gygax adventures were very much like that, where, where the NPCs were characters in his campaign. I mean, we've talked about that with Hamlet and, yeah. and, and everything. It's like all those, all those characters, you know, came from people. All the names of the spells were, were other players that, um, that were in their campaigns. So, um, you know, we think it's just a cool name, but like it was actually somebody actually played that character and, and that was fascinating um, aspect to it. So, uh, Rick, did you were so did you were you a fan of Temple of the Frog or the later ones or I was not as much into Blackmore as admittedly as I was into Greyhawk. I was a Greyhawk guy. Uh, um, me, again, I well. liked I liked the scope of Blackmore. I like I there was many times I would look at the large Blackmore map. That would illustrate all the countries and i remember thinking if i ever had characters that got to that point where they would kind of be running a country or you know kind of doing that kind of le power level having all those other countries around doing different things would be really interesting i thought that was something blackmore you know set up well but i never personally ran it i own the original blackmore i own the four blackmore modules but i don't think i ever ran any of them at the table yeah Yes, and same here. I I did not, and and again, and I I've mentioned this before. Expedition of the Barrier Peaks not my favorite of the adventures. I don't like my sci-fi and my fantasy mixed. I like either kind of hardcore sci-fi or or hardcore fantasy. I don't really like them kind of mixed. Mm -hmm. I'm I think I'm getting a little bit more of an appreciation over time. Yeah. Um, but definitely back when I was playing in the '80s, nope. I was yeah. I was either doing Star Wars or I was doing. D and D, and there was there wasn't yeah. I wasn't doing D and D Star meetings. Wars. <laughs> yeah, that was me back then too. You know, yeah. as the old commercial goes, you know, back then I didn't like peanut butter my chocolate or whatever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but now chocolate. that I get older, it's funny. Now I'm starting to see the appeal of that yeah. kind of crossover. So you see, you change. It's funny. Yeah, no, it, it it definitely does. So 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 Scott, did you ever play Temple of Frog, or did you just run it, or both? Uh, I ran it. Okay. Um, and again, kind of to, to Rick's point, if in the early days, if you were if you were playing a published campaign, you were probably playing Greyhawk, or mm -hmm. in my case, with D and D as opposed to AD and D, you were playing in Mystera, the known world. Yep. There wasn't a ton of Blackmore material out. Yeah. Um, you had you had the original supplement two. You eventually had the first fantasy campaign from Judges yep. Guild, and then it was mm -hmm. several years before you had the the DA one through DA four modules. Yeah. Um, but when, when, uh, Blackmore was relaunched for 3.5, um, and this was, like I said, the time that I was kind of like pen palling with, with Dave Arneson, um, my third edition campaign was Blackmore. 
Oh, nice. Um, with with a touch of the Wilderlands thrown in just because the two were connected via mm-hmm. the first fantasy campaign. So I actually ran a can- campaign from level one through they got above level 20, but I can't remember wow. how far they got. Uh, yeah. In addition, I also ran I was also a DM for the um, the Blackmore MMRPG living campaign. So I ran that a lot of conventions and stuff as well. Cool. Awesome. All right. Well, well, yeah, thank you for definitely bringing bringing a, a definitely a, a different perspective on, yeah. on an adventure that both Rick and I were not yeah. not as familiar with, um, I think. But it was great. Again, once again, it was great to go dive back into it and kind of read. And I remember yeah. it. It's like, as I was reading, it's like, oh, I remember this yeah. now and everything. And I remember the the basic version better um, because I never really read these books. Like these books, like I said, I married into these books um, <laughs> and I just kind of leave them. I'm like, you know, I do read them from time to time and everything. But for the most part, I do remember uh, flipping through the, uh, let's get the one with the uh, the frog and the the blaster on the front, right? Of the because uh, all my all my classic yep. modules are all packed up in boxes now. Yep. Frustrating that we're doing this show and all my stuff is in boxes. So, <laughs> or I should say, most of my things are in boxes. Um, but anyway, so uh, definitely a, a huge fan on that. So, um, yeah, do we have any parting words on Temple of the Frog? I don't think we mentioned that uh, Goodman Games' own Harley Stroh was involved in the writing of the. Uh, third edition from Zitgeist Games. That's right, and mm-hmm. and you have a you have something you can show us on that, can't you? Don't I, you have a little maybe nice little maybe I can. can show it. It'll show. But at yeah, the, at the this is the third uh, edition. There we, there we go. go. This, yeah, the same convention, the Gen Con that I got Dave Arneson to autograph my original supplement to. I got Harley Stroh to autograph there it is. this edition. Nice. There you go, Gen Con two thousand eight. So I collect autographed RPG books, so anytime I get. <laughs> a book and i see who's if i'm going to a convention i see who's going to be there i'll bring a yep. stack of books along just to get folks to autograph them nice ah oh, that is that's awesome so yeah so man i could have had harley on wow that's, that's okay so next time we'll get harley on at some i'm point. sure we'll get him on at some point <laughs> yeah totally so all right so that was number 44 temple of the frog uh original D uh basic D 3.5 D uh original publication 1974 Wow, we are just hitting into the old, the oldy, oldy classic. Classic as it gets. Yes, and our next number up is number forty-three. Number forty-three. Number forty-three. All right. All right. Caverns of Thracia. So now the po- now everybody really sees why we got Scott on. So if there's yeah, somebody yeah. who can talk Caverns of Thracia. It's probably this guy over here because there's nothing like knowing an old classic module than going and converting every single encounter of it, <laughs> really, really reading it and rereading it and literally living it for over a year, right? You spend yeah, a good, it was about yeah. a full year I worked on it, just yep. the conversion and yep. then some supplementary uh, material after that first year. Yeah, oh, we'll, we'll, we're gonna we'll talk about that supplementary material in a bit. Uh, coming to crowdfunding soon, folks. Uh, so we'll be we'll be launching the crowdfunding for OAR number nine, Caverns of Thracia, hopefully sometime this summer. So um, stay tuned on that. But Caverns of Thracia. So this is a uh, uh, obviously Judges Guild, um, AD and D. Although this was this the I know this was a, it wasn't AD and D. I think it was like did they not have the i can't remember there was i think this one i think this one was D, uh, dungeons and dragons officially on the i cover. think yeah. i think you're right i think it was dungeons and dragons yep. it was not actually ad and d um and this was 1979 i'm pretty sure is the, the publication date on this um now i think dark tower is probably a little bit more well known uh from janelle um but I think Caverns of Thracia, it's right there. I know mm-hmm. I was very familiar with Dark Tower, but I was not so much on Caverns of Thracia. Believe it or not, I don't think I got um, my introduction to Caverns of Thracia. I don't think it was until the Goodman Games reprinted the original version. I think that was 2007 or 2005, something like that. I forget what year it was. They actually reprinted the first edition version, and they also did a... I believe they did a third edition um, conversion as well. But So that was actually my... I knew of it. But I didn't know too much of it. But um, but yeah, it, again, not unlike Dark Tower, a big sprawling. I like how I think you called it, Scott, a cavern crawl, not a dungeon crawl, mm-hmm. um, because it was a little bit more of a wilderness. It was, uh, you know, jungle. Mm-hmm. 
uh, kind of a, it, it kind of gave you that lost city kind of feel, the uh, uh, dwellers of the forbidden city, a little bit kind of a feel there. Yep. Um, and uh, lots of lizard folk and dog folk and all kinds of good stuff. So, um, th- Rick, let's start with you first because I know Scott's sure. got lots to talk about this. So, what, what was your experience <laughs> with Caverns of Thracia? My experience of, with Caverns is limited because I owned it and then somebody borrowed it and never returned it in my youth, and that was that. It was one of those. I think everybody's got that one adventure that they or, or, or game book that went yep. south. Well, that was mine. So I did own it for a brief period, um, but it I think it's a you know a classic example of Janelle's work. I love the nonlinearity of it. And it contains a lot of things that a lot of Judges Guild books at that time contained, which I think is awesome, which is a lot of the little bits of backstory, a lot of little NPC details. They litter little kind of um, like like subsystems in there. I remember Caverns had like a little rumor system or they called the tavern system or something that was in there about what NPC knew what, which I loved because it was almost like you'd be reading a Judge's Guild book, I remember, and then all of a sudden it seemed like out of the blue they would just drop some rules on you and say, oh, by the way, yep. here's a little rule system for you, which maybe would break your chain of thought, but they were always little useful things, and that was something I really enjoyed. But I never ran it at the table, admittedly. So, yeah, my my uh, I, I bow to Scott and his expertise here because I know he's yeah. he's been in a lot more in the weeds with it <laughs> than I ever have. So, all right. So give us your backstory with Caverns of Thracia. Did you play it? Did you run it? What was, you know, and and why why did it make your list so high? Uh, I ran it, did not play it. Okay. Um, but back in the day, um, there were so many things from companies like, uh, I always point to like Judges Guild mm-hmm. and Mayfair's Roll Aids. Roll Aids, uh, yeah. As two lines of people who were doing D and D stuff, but weren't part of TSR. And there was so much great material, I think, from both companies that kind of went in, you know, uh, I won't say weird directions, but different directions from the the products you would you would see from TSR. And Caverns of Thracia, at first glance, is a module, but really, it's a campaign setting. Yeah. Um, yep. It's not yep. like you're going to go through this and gain a level. You're going to go through this and you're going to gain like five levels over the course of several months of play yep. um, because you have each level is essentially several game sessions of play and it goes level after level after level. It's uh, almost reminiscent of keep on the borderlands and mm-hmm. that you could clear out an entire dungeon. Oh, but don't worry. There's still plenty more dungeons for you to look at. Yep. And yeah. Dungeons is kind of a loose term because there's really, <laughs> I think there's, I think there may actually be one dungeon in caverns of Thracia. But we refer to caverns as dungeons, and it's it's literally a cave crawl. The lost city, you come upon the western side of the city, and there's like the ruins of five buildings, and that's all that's detailed of the yeah. city. So the city. It, again, it's just <laughs> yeah, wide open for DMs to explore and, and add to. Um, there's an underground river that actually hits multiple points on multiple levels. So there's the possibility that that river flows through different sections that aren't even on the maps. Uh, And there was just so much to work with as far as like building uh, a larger campaign around what was in here. Um, It was, I think it's in the rule book, it actually said for like uh, for starting characters or something like that, there wasn't a level assigned to it. Yeah, I remember Um, that. Yep. But you could, you could start off with first level characters, probably a good idea to bring several. Um, and by the time you finish, you could be five, six, seventh level just with the material that's in there, not following up on any of the rumors or anything like that. And usually there were in the early modules, you were pretty assured that you were going to a place full of bad guys and you could just take out the bad guys here. There were so many factions and cults that opposed each other, but maybe willing to work with this group, but not with this group. Um, there were humans, like you mentioned, there were folk, there were minotaurs, there were lizard folk, there were um, all sorts of stuff in there. And some of them worked together, but not quite, weren't quite happy about working together. Um, and then there were other creatures, like there were uh, fake creatures on the one level. I think they were dryads. Mm-hmm. There was a whole group of dryads that had been oppressed by the minotaurs. So 
they hated everybody, even the adventurers, mm -hmm. because they were kind of foreigners and you know their only exposure to the outside world was being oppressed by these minotaurs and um the whole all the politics in it that if you wanted to mm -hmm. build on that um there were plenty of very interesting traps and rooms and um layouts to you know specific chambers and things like that um i'll call them magical traps <laughs> uh, kind of interesting <laughs> things that Janelle had put in there that you know stopped and made you think um it was it wasn't just a uh, a cave full of monsters for sure. Yeah, yeah, no, I I think I think you summed it up perfectly. I mean, it's it is it is a campaign setting. It is a sandbox, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of what you're you're talking about with the different factions, um, we saw that in in B two keep on the Borderlands mm -hmm. where you could actually pit some of the humanoid groups against each other. Um, and and I think it was intended that that's what you were supposed to do. So I think that was definitely kind of you know, um, definitely a part of this adventure as well, too. Again, you could just go in and 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 wipe them all out, but, you know, probably a better use of your resources would be to to, to look into, uh, you know, a, a different way, a little bit different way. To, is is there one particular encounter um, or section? You mentioned the Underground River, and I remember talking to people when, when I found out that we got the license for this. I was reaching out to folks that were very familiar with this adventure, all of them did an extra, like they always created another level down downstream, down the river. <laughs> they were like, oh yeah, it's like, I always, it's like you could, there's this area where the river flows right out and it's like, you can easily put more caverns in there. And like, everybody said that. So of course, you know, we we went ahead and did that too, because that's what we do. Um, but is there is there a particular encounter that you remember that that always kind of stuck out? Like, like Rick and I, when we were doing our Talking to TSR show, we always like, we would talk about when we mention a module, there's that first thing that comes yeah. to your yeah. mind. Like yeah. what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear Caverns of Thrace show? Uh, the first thing is a non-encounter. The first thing that comes okay. to mind. Uh, and it's room 102. Mm. And for those of you who haven't played, um, room 102, I think it was 102. It uh, might be 104. Not show was it 104? I don't remember. It's 102 it or 104. <laughs> um, <laughs> doesn't show up on any maps. Mm -hmm. And there's a little note in the module that says, yeah, sorry, we, we left out the uh, room 102 or 104, whatever it is. But if you look at the numbers on the map, there's like a perfect place for that room. Uh, so that was one of the areas that we kind of took some liberties and added some expansion uh, when we were talking about it. Um, the the uh, magical traps, again, I'll say, of the, the cult on the, the first and second levels um, there are some cool magical effects. Um, not necessarily all, they're not necessarily all traps, but there's just cool twists to, to some of the stuff that uh, Janelle put in some of the rooms there. Uh, and that was that was stuff that I really kind of liked. Not something that uh, you know necessarily is going to just inflict damage, and there's no way around it. But stuff that kind of sets the the players makes them a little bit more cautious and wonder what exactly does this mean? Is this bad? Is this good? I'm not quite sure what happened here. A uh, little stuff like that I like. Nice. So, um, and you mentioned that you got a chance to actually create additional material for uh, Caverns of Thrace in addition to the infamous 104 or 102, <laughs> which I believe we made a whole kind of a blow. You kind of, there was, it was one area, but with a bunch of sub areas, I think. There was, really. there was enough, there was enough space yeah. there to put a few connecting rooms. So we did yep. that. So, yeah, so we did that. But what, what other uh, material did you create to kind of tease and kind of plant the seeds of additional stuff that we got going on? Uh, let's see what well, we did the, because like I said, when you enter the caverns, you're entering the ruins of Thracia above ground on the Western side of the city's ruins. So we mapped out the rest of the city yep. and then we mapped out the rest of the Island that the city's on. Yep. And then I think we did the set of islands upon which Thracia is one of them. So we, yep. we, we expanded the campaign setting. We're no longer pretending it's a module. It is a campaign setting. <laughs> yep. It's it's our own little homage to the known world, if you will. We can't yeah. give it that about that much detail. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think I think folks are really gonna like it. Um as, as far as what we what we ended up doing with it. And again, it's always fun to to get an 80 page adventure or 75 page adventure this and then just be able to play there and and to kind of just you know mess around with, you know, do do the do the conversion, you know, keep it in the same tone and the same 
um, voice, if you will, Janelle's voice, but then also to be able to go and add additional, um, you know, encounters and materials is great. So um, we are running out of time here and we do have a, a hard stop. So we are going to, uh, any parting words on Caverns of Thracia before we move on to our next number? I'm biased. I'm a big fan. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a huge fan now too. It's one of those where you know, I actually, I don't know. It's like a toss up. I have such more respect for both Dark Tower and Caverns of Thracia after working on them for the last several years. I mean, <laughs> I probably still still like Dark Tower a little bit better just because it's Egyptian and it's yeah, desert. Me too. Um, but I also, you know, my 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 part two is 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 jungles and 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 you know caverns. So I mean, I do love that one as well too. So, um, all right. So we are going to move on to number forty two. Number 42. All right. So, uh, so I believe this is our, no, this is, yeah, is this our first second edition D&D? No, did we already have, I don't even remember our old list now, so yeah. this might be our first. I can't I think remember. this is our first. Okay, okay, yeah. Um. So, Return to the Tomb of Horrors. So, again, uh, this was 1998, Um. Bruce Cordell. This was a box set, if I recall. Yeah. Um. And, uh, so uh, this one was interesting. So we talked about this earlier in, in the show that a good sign of a classic adventure is when it's reprinted and reprinted and reprinted yep. in all the different editions. And, and, and you know, it, it just it just strikes something. So this this is that once again, um, but then kind of taken to another level, um, which yeah. which was which was kind of a, a good level, to be honest with you, um, because the the original Tomb of Horrors um, of which. I think it's no secret. I am not a fan <laughs> of the original Tomb of Horrors. Um, I've run it a couple of times. I've never played. Actually, that's true. I think I did play it once. It didn't last long. You can figure that out. Um, uh, but yeah, I just it, I was just never, never a huge fan. I, I thought it did have some flaws. I, I appreciate it now, understanding more the backstory of why it was developed the way it was. Um, but this was... If I had to choose between two, this is something I probably would have gravitated toward because this was again more of a campaign setting based yeah. off of a classic adventure. Um, and uh, but I myself, I never played this one. I know I obviously I read it. Um, and uh, I do remember a couple of interesting tidbits about it. But um, Rick, why don't you start off with? I think you have a good amount of experience with this guy being our resident. Tomb of Horrors expert. <laughs> sure. And I, I kind of chuckled at our exchange before the show uh, via email because Scott, you know, it, he he said, I think I'm in the minority, but I wasn't a big fan of the whole Tomb of Horrors. Thing. And I felt like saying, no, I'm the minority because yep. I am a fan <laughs> of the Tomb of Horrors. Um, I was, I, I'm unabashedly a big fan of the original Tomb of Horrors. And it certainly is is taken to level 11 in this one. Um yeah. I think it's a two-edged sword here. I think if it certainly expands and riffs and continues with the thread of the original Tomb of Horrors in the same vein, so you're definitely getting more of the same and in some very imaginative directions when you get you get extra planar, you get travel to the, the city that awaits, and there's really some cool encounters and, and, and how you transition from one element to the other, and it's a very logical pro progression sort of history where the how the tomb has changed and how this sort of city of necromancers has built itself up around you know the black academy and the skull city has built itself up around the tomb so the characters sort of show up expecting they're just going to go back to the tomb and no there's there's now a whole kind of cabal of necromancers that are semi worshiping the tomb that have shown up there making things even more complicated which i think is wonderful um but again two-edged sword because it is such a lethal campaign and it is a campaign that whereas the tomb was deadly this extends that deadliness for such a long period that you know somebody's going to die um and i i chuckle and i love looking at the art within this book because it illustrates a party of the adventurers and you see basically the adventurers get picked off as the pictures continue through the book until i think out of a party of like you know seven or eight adventurers you see two toasting the rest of their departed comrades in one of the final pictures which i think is great um but yeah i i i like this book i think it was out of the expansion type modules it was a solid module like you said chris you can tell a classic when it's and two more Hearts is one of the only books i can think of that's been in every edition of D, &D that's been basically so, yeah. first through fifth 
you know, in other offshoots it's appeared in. Um, and I always just said, I, I like the purity of the original Tomb of Horrors. You know, I'll get to that if it comes up again. But basically, I've run the original six times for different groups. And and none of, and, and for a lot of beginning players, and those players didn't walk away traumatized. They actually liked the game because it distills it down to the purity of D&D. &D. Do you go down the hallway or do you walk through the arch? Do you open this door? Or you open that door? It cuts out all the extraneous noise. And I guarantee if you play these, your players will not be looking at their cell phones. They will be paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> but what do you think, Scott? Yeah, like, as as you mentioned, I was not a huge fan of it. It's um, and I was I was not familiar to full disclosure here. I was not familiar with the return of the uh, return to the tomb from second edition, um, but it had. It had a bit of a feel to Horrors in general has a bit of that feel of um D, D being a competitive game between mm -hmm. yeah. the dm and the yeah. players yep. uh and competitive gameplay is not my personal style mm -hmm. um i'm more in hey let's let's try to tell as cool a story as we can together yeah everybody writes their own parts and i'll try to weave it into something uh coherent but the i think the original was and and gary gyax even made some references back in the early days of you know it's my job is to kill the player characters or, you know, paraphrasing yeah. or, you know, yeah. um, but this was, I thought, I always thought Return to Tomb of Horrors was one of those really twisted adventures um, that if you just want to be cruel to your players, here's the package for you to be, mm -hmm. to be cruel with. Um, that being said, uh, during my 4E campaign, uh, I, there was, uh, because like you said, they came out in every version um there was a hardcover book that did have uh the tomb the future version of the tomb on the with the city of necromancers around and i did use that um for part of my campaign um but it was just uh it was a brief visit it wasn't you're not stuck here until you can find your clothes and your weapons again kind of thing mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so okay so that was that was kind of your kind of history of it um I recall that the box set included a reprint of the original. Is that mm -hmm. correct, Rick? Yeah. And then you actually use it when you're playing? I think yes. there was a part where you actually go to the, the tomb. Yeah, is one that... of the things okay. I thought was cool is the box set, it basically included a standalone reprint of the module that, honestly, I had the original module. It looked like the original module. You yeah. Could... It was the mono on version too, right? Like you had a clean printing. What's that? Yeah, it was the mono version, right? Right. Yeah. It wasn't the green yeah. one. It was the, the no. British. It was the it was that kind of pinkish reddish pinkish mono reddish. version. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's what I mean. It looked like the original, which I loved because my original was in tatters. You yeah, know? yeah. Uh, through lots of use. Um, and again, and again, and and I acknowledge what Scott's saying because certainly, and and this honestly. I saw this, I, I felt like I saw this in a lot of Gygax's writings, not just in the Tomb of Horrors, that, you know, he definitely seemed to have that, well, I'm going to fix my players kind of mentality. Oh, yeah. Which I definitely don't espouse as a, as a DM. For me, it's just about having, you know, let's make a cool experience at the table together type of thing. Um, but again, for me, it was, I love puzzles. I love having characters figure out clues and, and you know, things like that. And it just individual set pieces. And it had a lot of that. Um, but yeah, it's quite a big, it's quite a, Bruce Cordell really wrote a monster with this. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it was, it was quite, it was an impressive package. I remember it was, I think, one of the first larger box sets that they used yeah. to do the thinner box sets. This yeah. one was like, I don't know if it was double the size, but it was definitely much bigger. So, yeah. all right, we, we have to move along because we do have a hard stop tonight because there is a, a charity event on after us. So, um, so our last one of the evening is going to be number 41. Um, so we will. Number 41. And All okay. right. Cool. Um, well, I, I'm excited that this one made, made the list. Um, and and this was this was important because I mean uh, uh, if folks know me, um, <laughs> this one's in my top ten. So um, the fact that everybody knows I voted for this one really high, and it still only made number forty one, um, it kind of shows that I think we had enough judges, and it kind of you know I think it even up good because if we didn't have enough judges, this would probably be way up a lot higher than it should be. But this is probably about right. It, it, you know I don't know that probably 
I think it deserves to be in the top 50 adventures. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, I, I don't think, you know, stacking up with all the other classics out there, it's definitely not top 10 material. But uh, Egg of the Phoenix, um, I, I've spoke, we did uh, last year when we did our wrap-up show, we talked about our top mm -hmm. five adventures that we wished we did a whole episode <laughs> on. And Egg of the Phoenix was, was like, yeah. I think, my number one or number two, I forget. Um, I mean, I, again, I love so much about this adventure. Again, it, it's it's not an adventure. It's a whole setting. There's a whole yeah. campaign map. Um, it's all these different adventures. They were originally kind of standalone adventures, and mm -hmm. they were kind of shoehorned in together. But there's just so much material here. Um, there's so many. What I love about it is there's all different adventuring sites. It's not yeah. same. It's not it's not Temple of Elemental Evil, where it's four dungeon levels of more humanoids, more humanoids. There's there's caverns, there's dungeons, there's mm -hmm. uh, enchanted forests, there's planar, there's, you know, there's fire giant layers. There's just, there's so many different um, things. And you literally globe trod around to uh, all these ancient citadels and all these things that are, again, steeped in in knowledge, uh, very much like, like Scott was saying about how Temple of the Frog was just, you know, there was a lot more there. There was all these little hints of the backstory and everything. Uh, you totally get that too. And, and some just amazing NPCs. Um, a, a revenant done right, a revenant that comes back at the end, kind of at a, at a crucial moment, um, which I love. It, just a, an amazing, huge battle. And and one of the inspirations that I've always taken from from uh, Egg of the Phoenix is the reoccurring NPCs, where you run into an NPC early, um, and then they'll go away or something, but then they'll come back for a later part of the story. And and players love that. They love when yeah. you introduce them to a character at first level, and then at fifth level or whatever, that 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 character comes back. Sometimes that character comes back as a rust monster. <laughs> um, <laughs> sometimes uh, it doesn't, uh, or it comes back evil, or 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 good, or redeems itself. Um, in the case of the rust monster, so that part I've always loved. I love the the um, the assembling of the heroes and almost kind of having like a. And I'm not a Marvel fan, but almost having a. Uh, having a Marvel moment where everybody at the end bands back together to fight the big bad. Um, and it's like, you, you know, you rescued this this creature early on and then you rescued this one and then you made friends with this one and you helped this one out. And then they all come back and help at the end. And it's kind of like, I don't know, it, it's cool. Um, most of the reasons why I love this adventure so much, I've mentioned this was just the stories that my group, I ran it once. I don't think I'll ever run it again. Um and just we just had just an amazing time with it. I mean, it was just the stories we made, the character growth that we had. It, it was just it was just absolutely amazing. Um, and I'll never forget that. It was probably the best campaign I've ever run. Although I have to admit, my current campaign right now is pretty damn good. So that one might might dethrone it. But for back in the for back in the eighties, it was the best campaign that I ever did. So um so i've rambled on long enough rick uh do you have anything possibly to add about uh, <laughs> it's hard to top that i agree as far as i love the variety of different kind of event you, you know you can tell this was a whole bunch of adventures that were yep. put together because there's so much variety there and if you buy it in this singular book there's so much bang for the buck there i think you could get so much mileage out of this book as far as play that I can't. Yeah, I, I mean, how much how much play do you think somebody would get out of this? Oh God, I mean, I remember it took us. Oh geez, months, probably fifteen and, sessions. Yeah, and it was yeah, definitely months. And months we played and once a week back then too. I book. mean, it it definitely took us months. I mean, so yeah, it's like, it's like it ninety six pages. Yeah, so I mean, for whatever that book costs when it originally came out, talk about getting your money's worth as a DM. You know, I never ran it originally, um, but it always impressed me, and it certainly has a lot of fans. You're not alone. A lot of people. I'm frankly not. I, I thought it'd be higher on the list, you know, and that's even without your vote. I thought it would still, yeah. it, I thought it would really be up there. It uh, didn't get a lot of votes, but the votes it got made it count. <laughs> okay, there you go. It had so, we'll get into supporters. that in the last show where we break down some of the numbers. Um, that's funny. We have a couple minutes left. Scott, do you, go do for you it, recall Scott. Egg of the Phoenix at all? Do you remember I it? I did not, did not play it, did not run it. Okay. Um, I, I'll so. just mention that it was written by Frank Menser, who did, yep. The basic expert companion masters of mortal sets yep. and uh janelle jaquez who did dark tower and yep. caverns of thracia did some additional design work on it and did the editing on it i believe yep. so yeah so uh, it came uh, from names. it came from a great yeah. group of uh early D D writers mm -hmm. without a doubt with it without yeah, a doubt yeah sure. so i mean it's, it's a classic I, I again i think rick makes a great point you can get all these things on pdf now or even you can get the 
uh, that you can get them um, on the print, you know, relatively inexpensively. Um, and again, this one's like 96 pages long. There was a whole pullout section with the uh, the pre-generated characters and the maps and the handouts and all that kind of stuff in the middle. Um, it, it, it was just it was phenomenal. And even if you don't use the whole thing as intended, you can certainly pull those little micro dungeons oh, yeah. out and everything. Yeah. Um, and I definitely appreciate that design where you've got, you know, if you're going to have a big mega dungeon or a big campaign setting, do a lot of little dungeons and keep mm -hmm. them different and mix them up and everything. Don't have it so yeah. samey um, and, and, you know, mix up the, the environment um, and the different quests that you can get into everything. A couple people joining us late. Awesome Possum. Awesome. Oh, I had trouble saying this one last time. Awesome Possum 6942. Yes, uh we are live, um, but we're going to be signing off in a few minutes. But don't worry, this will be on uh, YouTube later. Uh, Bug Professor dropping in. Bug Professor, I have your... Oh, yeah, all right. I'm going to do some free advertising for the Bug Professor right here. So this this showed up this week. Uh, Bug Professor's <laughs> very first uh, zine, uh, DCC module. Nice. Loving it. So, um, yeah. So, uh, Okay. Uh, so we are about at the end of the show. Um, Rick, uh, why don't you tell the people what you got to tell them? Sure. And and first, before we forget, thank you, Scott, for joining us on this show. Yes. Thanks for having me. It was awesome a lot of fun. having you and hearing your opinions. Everyone, we're thrilled you could join us again here for the 50 greatest classic adventures of all time. As always, uh, please give us a follow. Give us a like. If you're watching later on YouTube, uh, don't be afraid to subscribe because it does help us. And keep those comments coming. We read every single one of them. Our next show will be coming back to you on April 28th at 8 p.m., so a little later than this evening. And we're going to be going into the list and just going along right into uh, number 40 through 36, and we'll see what they, they are. So I hope you can join us then. Yeah, and I would like to thank Scott for joining us again. Uh, we greatly appreciate having an extra voice here to help us out with some of the adventures that we were not quite as familiar with. Hopefully, uh, <laughs> My hopefully he brought something extra to the show tonight and everything. Uh, and yeah, folks, uh, we, we do read the comments. Uh, Rick and I are talking about maybe even making some changes to the show. So yeah. the, the, the way that we do the show. So yeah, um, so yeah, so keep those comments coming and everything. And uh, we really appreciate it. Everybody have a wonderful uh, rest of their evening and we will see you guys in about another month so have a good night see you soon take care all bye, -bye.